Five kilometers more land we have or five kilometers less. This is not important. Nikita Khrushchev told Mao Zedong in 1959, his angry voice rolling over the garden of abundant beneficence where the Chinese communist leader lived. The issue that had sparked this big argument was India. The Soviet Union had ceded territory to Persia and Turkey, Khrushchev noted, trading land to ensure its security. But Mao's use of force against India, he argued, was pushing then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru into the United States-led Cold War camp. Less than three weeks after that argument, an Indian patrol led by police officer Karam Singh was ambushed as it entered the mouth of the Kugrang River, close to where the line of actual control now runs. Ten police personnel were killed and seven taken prisoner. Last week, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi made the first visit to India by a senior Chinese official since the murderous clash in Galwan in 2020. He came with no proposals to end the still simmering military tensions. At patrol point 15, close to the site of the 1959 killings, nor in the Depsang plains or Demchok. Instead, Foreign Minister Wang said, India ought put the border conflict in its proper place and engage on other issues. For months though, India has tried to do just that. New Delhi statements coyly refer to friction points, not territory seized by China. India agreed to asymmetric disengagements in Pangong and Gogra. Trade with China has boomed and New Delhi has broken with its partners in the quadrilateral security dialogue on Ukraine. In spite of this, Wang's visit shows China is unwilling to give up its coercive posture on the line of actual control. To address this challenge, India should take the advice Khrushchev offered Mao. Instead of obsessing over a few kilometers of strategically irrelevant territory on the LAC, it needs to define a genuinely defensible border with China and grow the resources to hold it. In 1960, another young Indian diplomat watched a Chinese Prime Minister visit Delhi. No Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai slogans, the young Indian diplomat K. Natwar Singh, who later became Foreign Minister, wrote in his diary in April 1960, as China's Prime Minister Shu Anlai arrived in New Delhi. The welcome was subdued, if not chilly. For months after the 1959 clash, Nehru rejected calls from China for high-level negotiations. Then he decided to take a chance. Although for the moment there is no basis for negotiations, the Prime Minister wrote to Khrushchev, a personal meeting will generally be helpful. Wang Yi's visit and the multiple summits between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping which preceded it show that this personal relationship isn't necessarily helpful. There are important lessons to be learned from the failed diplomatic efforts that punctuated the period from the 1959 clash to the War of 1962. Following the 1959 fighting, Chinese leaders indicated they understood Indian concerns. In a 1960 meeting with Swaran Singh, then Steel Minister, Foreign Minister Chen Yi accepted that the 1959 ambush had, I quote, perturbed Indians and made them think about their own security. The two sides both proposed arrangements for preventing clashes, which involved demilitarizing swathes of territory. But neither could really accept the other's terms. In the build-up to the 1960 Nehru Shu summit, the historian Srinath Raghavan has recorded, both sides also considered making what would have been dramatic concessions. Early in April, Vice President Sarvepalli Radhakrishnan told the British High Commissioner to India, Malcolm MacDonald, that India's border claims in the northeast, that is, in the northeast of India, were immutable. In return for their recognition though, New Delhi was prepared to allow China to remain, and I quote, in practical occupation of the same territory which they now occupied. That meant India was willing to basically swap Ladakh for the McMahon line in the northeast. For his part, Shu suggested a trade-off too. In his talks with Nehru, the Chinese Prime Minister noted the two countries stood on either side of the British Imperial McMahon line, which was India's claimed border. In Ladakh, China claimed a line running from Karakoram to the Konka La Pass, the site of the 1959 Kermish. The two sides, he implied, could do a deal. 
and swap. Facing a public enraged by the 1959 clash and untrusting of China's intentions, Nehru, however, declined the deal. For his part, Mao was determined to extinguish challenges to China's regional hegemony. He wasn't willing to accept half sovereignty over Ladakh. Faced with an impasse, India began setting up small outposts to assert its presence in Ladakh. The Chinese would like to come right up to their claim of 1960, wherever we were ourselves not in occupation, the Intelligence Bureau recorded in 1961. But where even a dozen of our men are present, the Chinese have kept away. The army concurred with this assessment. The Chinese will not attack any of our positions, even if they are relatively weaker than theirs, the Chief of General Staff told the Defence Ministry on the eve of war. These were, of course, horrible miscalculations, as we now know. In the summer of 1962, a PLA patrol through the Galwan Valley discovered the Indian Army had beaten them to it. Some 30 troops of the 1st Battalion of the 8th Gurkha Regiment were already there. Even as a diplomatic protest note made its way to Delhi, 350 PLA troops surrounded the post on 10th June 1962. Then, on the morning of 20th October, PLA troops attacked across the entire Ladakh sector. Faced with intense artillery and mortar bombardment that leveled their ramshackle shelters within minutes, the troops in Galwan fought to the last bullet. They lost 36 of their number before they were eventually overrun. In spite of heroic resistance from other forward posts too, the Indian army was steamrolled. India's forward policy thus flailed in the face of fire. India's official history of the 1962 war puts it thus. In trying to defend every inch, the Indians ended up losing much more than they need have. Even though the concessions India has made on the LSE have angered many hawks, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's response makes strategic sense. The crisis on the LSE has involved enormous resources. It's sucked up troops and materials with no clear end in sight. Forces earlier committed to the Pakistan border have had to be thinned out, including two infantry divisions, earlier part of the One Strike Corps, India's cutting forward formation. Growing India's troop strength won't fix the problem. Logistics experts estimate China's high-speed rail and roads could allow the PLA to move up seven division-sized formations into Tibet inside just a week and over 32 inside a month. India's posture on the seas isn't, truth be told, comforting either. Financial problems have forced the Navy to shelve ambitious plans to grow its feet. Fond hopes of support from Western allies haven't materialized either. The Pentagon's Global Posture Review last year decided against committing more physical resources to the Indo-Pacific region and a $1 trillion plan to grow the United States Navy is in cold storage. Ladakh, terrain where India faces high mountains and therefore has an inexorable geographical disadvantage against the PLA, which is on a plateau, threatens to become a kind of black hole, swallowing up already overstretched military resources. Fond dreams of recapturing Aksai Chin need to be replaced with clear-eyed thinking on the borders India actually considers worth fighting for and what exactly is needed to defend them. Like in 1962, India is in real danger of trapping itself on the line of control, fighting for ill-defined ends with means that aren't adequate. From the war in Ukraine, we've learned that smart militaries, not big ones, win wars. India needs to encourage thinking on creative ways of war fighting, the technologies that can enable them, and an economy that can power them both. Lawrence Friedman, the great scholar in his magisterial work on strategy, defines it thus, identifying objectives and the resources and methods for meeting such objectives. India's real strategic problem isn't a few wastelands on the line of actual control, but a rising superpower with vastly greater economic wealth and military resources. Pushing back against it is the biggest single strategic challenge the country now faces. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Press.